Well, it's great to be here. Great to be back in the Bay Area. Awesome to be at Stanford. Um, so the first thing I, I'm going to start off with, you're going you're gonna to hear me talk today a lot about time and that I'm, I'm a big believer in that we can't waste time. And we're together today for probably 50 minutes or so, uh, and there's going to be a Q&A period as part of this. And many of you I know have already researched and, and um, researched both on myself and on Banjo, but most of what you're going to hear today is new. It's going to be new to you. And so please, as you're hearing this, I just ask you to keep an open mind. I ask you to get your questions ready because you should have a lot of questions. And whether it's in the class after this or whether it's in here, um, I hope that you get an opportunity uh, to ask them. And um, I'm a very transparent person, so no topic is, is off topic for me. Uh, so please, uh, get, you know, bring the heat, if you will. So um, I'm going to start off talking about um, every day we have decisions that we make that, that change the way that our life will go, right? And the, some of them are small decisions and many of them are large decisions. But we get information today in, in, in a time, in a time frame that we, who in this room actually has heard of the, the term like real time, right? Real time analytics, real time data. But real time, you know, for you and I, we think of it as live, like right now, right? We're having a conversation in real time. The reality is the way the term has been used in tech and in our everyday lives, real time is just the best that people can do. And the problem with real time is that real time is truly historical. It's already happened in the sense that when we're looking at information and data for us to make decisions that are going to impact our own lives, real time data is filtered, if you will, at that point. It's like the telephone game. I tell you something, you tell someone else. By the time it gets to the third person, it's already been altered. You didn't mean for it to, but just we're humans. And that's what happens. If something's not happening live, then it can become biased. And if it becomes biased, then we're not making the best decisions that we can make because we're already looking at the data, the information to make a decision, either late or we're making it the decision through someone else's eyes. And so today I'm going to talk a lot about the change in time that we as human beings are going through right now and the, the way that you as a human being are going to be able to make better decisions uh, in your life. It is a paradigm shift that we're going through today from this real-time concept to truly understanding as things happen live. And I'm going to break it down so we can all look at certain things that are happening in our own lives today, things that are important. So how does this bring us to, to Banjo and what, is, what does Banjo do? For those of you who've researched Banjo, you probably think you have an, a pretty good idea but now I'm going to hopefully blow your minds on what we really do behind the scenes. Years ago, I saw that real time was not good enough. Real time is the reason why today, unfortunately, many people don't get the aid that they need and the time they need it to save their life or to reduce human suffering. But if they had information live or if someone else had information live, they could have made a decision, a better decision that could have saved someone's life. And so at Banjo, we are this live intelligence platform that has built a system that can truly take in the world of live public data. And I know that sounds like a big statement, the world of live public data, but I mean it. We process today, whether it's 911 phone calls, live public cameras that are out there, social media, traffic, weather, Think of all the different types of live data signals that are happening around you every single day, happening around us right now that we don't even realize. Think how many of them could impact your life if you only knew that it was happening, or if you could put five of them together at once, which as we know is, doesn't happen and it's, and it's very difficult. So what Banjo is able to do is take in these thousands and thousands of signals. And what do I mean by a signal? Well, if I'm talking to you about 911 phone calls, and I, I mean all 911 phone calls, that's one signal. If I'm talking to you about a social network, that's only one signal, all of it. We process thousands and thousands of different types of signals every single second. And when we process that, by that mean is we gather all that information live while it's still streaming. It has not been altered in real time in this sense of historical. It's still live. And in that moment, 
We've built artificial intelligence that truly understands what is happening in these signals. But because we have so much data and so many signals, we can also determine what is real and what is false. Because no matter how good a source of data is, no matter where it's coming from, one source of data is, I call it as no data. If for those of you that are entrepreneurs, when you get out one day and you're gonna raise money, possibly from venture capitalists, I always tell those that I'm mentoring in that is one buyer is no buyer. Meaning, if you only have one offer, it's equivalent to no offer. You, you know, you need to get more. <laughs> Same thing with data. You can't make the best decisions in your life from one piece of information. And so how do you bring in so many different pieces of information that are so unrelated to one another, but yet coming together and being combined from all these multiple sources can tell us the degree of confidence, the degree of truth that is coming out of each signal. And then to find the anomaly. So now we have all these signals coming in live from around the world, all right now. And then how can we determine what that means? Is there something that you need to act on? Is there something that's gonna change your life? Is there something gonna maybe even save your life or a loved one's life? And so how this works is this data comes in, live on a stream, and our system knows what everywhere in the world looks like now because we've been listening for a long time. And what you may be thinking to yourself is, wow, this, this sounds pretty scary. Someone that has access to that much data. In fact, I think it's the largest live data store now in the world with more signals than any other one company has. But the big difference here is the day I started this company until now, and that's been a, it's been a long time, we've always protected user data in a way that others have never, never done. And we've stripped the data of personal identifiable information. In fact, most of our data suppliers, we request that they don't even send us any PII at all. But if they do, we patented a process that scrubs that so that even our engineers won't have access to PII, right? So it's always protecting the user data. We as a company have never sold data, ever. And you may think like, well, wait a minute, if you have this much data and this much insights and you guys know what's going on before anybody else, why wouldn't you have sold the data? We'll talk later about ethics and artificial intelligence and the way that we've led this company since the day we started it and why we've made those decisions. But getting back now to how all of this information comes in and we know what normal looks like. So when normal is disrupted, and then we can validate that disruption by multiple other types of signals that cannot be influenced by another signal, we can verify that something's happening. Let me give you a few instances. Last year, October 1st, in the city of Las Vegas, you guys all know about the large shooting that took place. Our system was listening. And in the moment of that shooting, our system knew that not only was there a shooting, that it was affecting many people at the uh, Route uh, 91 Harvest Fest on the Strip in Las Vegas, and it knew where the shooter was, and it knew all of this before the 911 phone call even was made. Before the 911 call was even made, the system had gone through all of this information, had made sense of it, and had validated it and verified it. And we as a company sent that information out to the media, right, to let them know that this was happening. Unfortunately, the reality of it is that the media, once they get it, they'll do their fact checking, but they also got to think about how they're going to put headlines on things or when they're going to send something out. So there's a delay. This is when we go to, back to real time. We were at live. And the difference between live information not getting out in the Vegas incident, police officers showed up to the wrong hotels. Many of the people, hundreds of people that needed to go to the hospital and finally made it to the hospital, the hospitals didn't know that there was a large shooting that happened until people started showing up at the doorstep almost an hour later. Then doctors had to be paged, and that takes another hour before doctors come in, and blood has to be trans transferred to the hospital. That golden opportunity to save that life is now long gone. We don't think as a society that this is even possible because... We see in movies, like, that's not how it works in the movies. Well, uh, it's not real life. This is real life. Parkland school shooting the same way. The hospitals were completely unprepared. 
because they don't have live information being fed to them. We would think they would, but they do not. And so that has to change. So at Banjo, we're making sure that all of this information that's being collected is being collected for the purposes of one mission. And this is a part in Silicon Valley, and not just in Silicon Valley, but outside, where our mission really changes um, and differentiates us from the rest in the sense that it's not a mission statement. It's a mission. And the mission is to save human life and to reduce human suffering by using artificial intelligence for good. And you could say, well, what is good? I just stop it at that statement right there. That's what good is. Because we can all sit here and justify how to use artificial intelligence against data in a way we believe is good. But if you really stop and think about it, and you ask yourself the question, how do you feel about that? And for just one moment, you get that little tingly sensation in your gut, it's probably not the right thing to do. For example, we could be selling this data today and completely disrupting the stock market. There's no doubt that we know things long before the high frequency traders know them in Wall Street. And we've been offered contracts of dollar amounts that would blow your mind, and we've always said no. People thought I was crazy way back when, when we were filing patents on how to protect user privacy because no one cared eight years ago about that, right? Now today, it's a big topic, and so everyone's like, there's a spotlight on it. But we never wavered from that. And that's what's put us in the position today where people trust us by bringing in this anonymized data. But remember, it truly is anonymized, and it's public data. It's just being brought in at a speed, a speed of live, that others have never been able to do and verifying it so that you or I uh, can make a big difference in the world. And so let me give you a few examples of how, of how this technology uh, is being harnessed. About, <clears throat> oh, three months ago now, an attorney general from a different state contacted me and said, I've seen the demo of, your, of what your product can do. And it's amazing how you unsilo all of these data sources from all these different places to get us information faster for the purposes of saving our citizens' lives in our state. Well, we would like to see if you could put a dent in child abduction. And I said, okay. I, I, I personally understand and, and, have a, uh, um, and can relate to child abduction, so how could we solve it? And so he, what he did is he invited us down for a statewide a drill where they actually abducted a real child with an actor uh, and hundreds of police officers, different agencies participated in this, just like if, if the child had been abducted. And the federal agencies were there, and the state agencies is there, and the local agencies. And when this child was abducted, they went hours, many, many hours. In fact, I think the report came out that it was like 13 hours later. They just happened upon the child uh, by getting a good lead, a good tip that led them to the child. But the average statistic is that the average child taken by a stranger, would have unfortunately died within the first three hours after the abduction. And so when the drill was done, the attorney general and his investigators looked at our information that had gone out to them live. We didn't know anything about the drill. We didn't know any of the details. And what they determined is that if they had been using us at that time, that that child would have been recovered in just a few minutes after the abduction. And almost most certainly would have obviously been alive, which is the difference between life and death of a child. It was so profound to them that this attorney general went to many other states' attorney generals, all the way to the federal government, and all the way down to local police departments, not in his state, but across the United States. And in just a few short months, this software, this technology now being used for child abduction has now forever changed the way children will be recovered in this country, and, and I'll assure you, as I'm standing here today, that years from now, we look back on the successful rate of recovery when a child is abducted, uh, will have been changed forever because of something that happened literally 90 days ago. And so now, we move from a, a, an amazing opportunity to save the life of a child to other opportunities that this thing that this technology allows us to harness. For example, we all hear about the opioid crisis that's ravaging 
throughout this country. And we, you know, we hear that we're, we're putting a lot of money into it, meaning the, the government's put $9 billion recently into it, but is it really making a difference? And the problem that we find is that there's all these silos of data. We think in a perfect world that everybody works together. It couldn't be further from the truth. Federal government doesn't work with state government. State government doesn't work with local governments. They don't work with private companies. A lot of reasons for that. Protectionism, right? Old, I'll call it tribal wars between agencies or between private companies. Private companies not wanting government to have access to information. But all the data to solve the opioid crisis is literally right in front of us. It's just never been put together in a way that gives us a clear picture live in order to get ahead of the problem. We're always on our heels with the problem. We're never able to get in front. And now with Banjo and what we've developed with all this live information, the ability now to get in front of the opioid crisis is now in front of us. And we, we literally will be um, able to put a massive dent in that, a real dent, a measurable dent. And you'll, <clears throat> a lot of you are sitting here today saying, well, why haven't I seen this? And why, um, when I've researched Banjo, why haven't I seen or heard any of this? Well, it's on purpose. While we're very transparent, and I said to you before today, when I got up here, please ask me any question that comes to mind, because um, we are very transparent. I'm very transparent, sometimes too transparent. Uh, but I want you guys to be able to understand how this is used, why it's used, so you truly get an understanding. Because what's hard is when you're very quiet, like we are, and I'm gonna tell you why we're quiet in a minute, but it's hard to educate on a technology that sounds like, well, it sounds like mythical. It sounds like this is not possible. If this was possible, why didn't a Google do it? Why didn't a Microsoft do it? How, how could this have not uh, have already existed? And there's a couple of simple reasons for that. Uh, and number one is, you know, having someone internally that has vision and a mission to get something accomplished that's very personal to them. Number two is having the credibility to get access to a tremendous amount of data sources that, as I said, with all these silos, government wouldn't trust certain private companies with data uh, and vice versa. And we've broken those walls down. But it's hard when you don't go out there and you don't put yourself out there publicly. But the reason we ch decided a long time ago, I think the last major article on us that I did was about four years ago. And it was very distracting at the time because everybody who realized what we had, the acquisition offers from the giants came and they kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger to where our investors, even our employees were like, this is game changing, you know, we should, we should you know, think about selling. Or maybe it was, you should think about selling this technology or using this technology in the stock market. But remember what I told you, we only use this for saving human life and reducing human suffering, period, the end. And so if it doesn't meet that goal, it's, it, it, I can't be tempted by money. We can't be tempted by money. And that's a hard thing for people to say, right? And it even sounds a little uh, like BS with you sitting out there. Like, and, and so <clears throat> when I was introduced, they said that I have a, have a little bit of unusual background. Well, we all do. We all have different life experiences, right? Life experiences that are going to enable you to create something amazing, whether you become an entrepreneur and start it yourself, or will you support other entrepreneurs to create amazing change? And it's not unlike what has happened here at Banjo and why this exists today. So for me, I'm a homeless kid. And, I, and I, when I say homeless, I mean like I was really homeless for years. I lived under the underpass of a freeway. I ate out of the dumpsters. I never went to high school. You know, and, and people say, well, why, why would you be homeless? And, and, and how, how long? And, and Well, there's a lot of circumstances. And it starts up in the home. And things happen in the home that you have to escape from. And, and I rebelled and escaped from that before I could even get a driver's license. And so no education, no driver's license, no money. Um, and there I am on the streets of L.A. Uh, for a long time and for years. And so I understand what it's like to live with... with Literally nothing, not even your dignity. 
And then I was fortunate enough that uh, there was an opportunity for me to go into the military during Desert Storm. For many of you who weren't even born then, but in 1990, when Desert Storm was starting up, they needed able bodies, and I was able bodied. I didn't have an education, but I was an able bodied person. And so I was able to get myself out of the streets and bring myself into the military where I excelled. Um, and that really helped me start a new foundation for myself, gave me some pride, gave me some dignity, and, and then eventually gave me the wherewithal and the finances to get an education. And from that education, I spent time, um, as, as you guys heard, in, in becoming a chief mechanic in a top NASCAR team because I wanted to understand what that was about. I then went and studied from everything from the FBI to law enforcement to homicide investigation because I wanted to become a crime scene investigator before there was the TV show Crime Scene Investigation uh, because I wanted to understand what it was like to solve hard challenges. And, and so I went out there in law enforcement and I did that for a while. And then I was lucky enough to start hacking my way through things and eventually found myself at a few of these big hackathons. The last major one was at Google. And when I won that, uh, you know, the investors here in Silicon Valley asked me who I was because I wasn't from here and I was able to raise a significant amount of money. And here we are, and, uh, you know, years later with Banjo, um, you know, being so transformational. It didn't start off transformational, right? Because the technology and artificial intelligence didn't even exist when we started it. But, you know, we quickly adopted it early on. I think it was like 2012, 2013, we were doing artificial intelligence at, um, at a level still that I believe most still aren't even doing. Um, but we always thought about the ethical, uh, the ethical constraints and, the, and our ethics around artificial intelligence. And so as you as entrepreneurs, as you get out there to start in your journey, I want you to think about how are you going to ask yourself, what is the ethical use of artificial intelligence? How should we be using this? What is the best thing that we can do, not just for yourself, but for mankind? And it's a hard decision. I sit there and listen to my friends who run big companies today, and they sit there and justify how they're selling people's data and making money for something like advertising. And I, say, and I quickly say to them, I said, well, those people don't know you're selling their data. And they say, no, but we justify it because, you know, they've opted in to, to use this, so therefore we're selling that. And I'm not here to pass judgment on them, and, and I'm not passing judgment. But for me, I don't like the way that feels. And so I, even if I could sit there and justify it to myself, I know what that initial feeling is. And so what I ask you to do, because this is a very hard subject that humanity has to deal with today not just the artificial intelligence and the ethics around it, the ethics around people's data, is how does it make you feel? And I don't mean how does it make you feel after you've sat there and convinced yourself how it makes you feel. Go with that initial instinct in your gut. And you know what I'm talking about. You feel that way before an exam. You feel that way before you, maybe there's a tough question or, or a tough conversation you got to have with somebody. We inherently know what the right thing to do is. We just ignore it. We ignore it because it's either uncomfortable or there's an advantage to us, maybe financially, to ignore it. And, and that gets me to the other point. People always tell me, Damien, this is great. What Banjo doing and saving lives at this level is unprecedented. But most people would use your technology and they go make money first. Go make a lot of money. And then you become altruistic. You don't become altruistic now because you can never become a big company. And I'm not just sitting here to prove them wrong, but we are going to prove them wrong because this is already becoming a big company. And we have been altruistic about it. Our mission is very altruistic. And you can be altruistic in the things that you want to do in life. And don't let people tell you that altruism at the end of the day comes at the cost of financial gain. Right? And we can have a whole debate and discussion about what does it mean to be a financial gain and how, do you, how should you feel about that or... Or, or what makes you feel successful? Is it, just, is it just money? Right? Now, don't get me wrong. This has to make money. This has to be successful in a, in a significant way, or else we could never continue to grow, and we would never achieve our mission of the amount of lives and ending of human suffering that we want to do. But each and every single person in this room, 
You have a unique life story, like I have a unique life story. Yours just is different. Different is, is not better or worse. It's that. It's different. You can create and do amazing things, things that I could never even dream of, things that I couldn't even understand because of your unique experiences, because of the things in life that you're either dealing with today, you dealt with before, or the things that you aspire that you want to accomplish in the future. And that's why you can create something amazing. Even if you're sitting there today and saying, I don't know that's for me, that's okay. You don't have to make a decision today on what's best for you today. But I can assure you, if some homeless kid with no education, who's probably my best accomplishment in life is the fact that I'm not in prison, has been able to achieve something of this magnitude that is literally changing the way that we will be able to deliver information to people faster. You will get information faster. That it'll make, it'll make a massive change in your life for the better or for, for your loved one's lives for the better. You can do anything. And so don't feel the pressures of you needing to go out and start something. I mean, every time I come and speak at one of these things, everyone feels this need that they need to become the entrepreneur and come out with the next big thing. Not so. I'm grateful that behind me, I have an amazing team of people and have had an amazing team of people for almost eight years ago when I started this. Several of them are sitting here that were there the day I started it and are still with me today. And I'm grateful that they didn't go out on their, their entrepreneurial ventures of their own, that they've been able to support the craziness coming out of my head every day to make it a reality. And so just because you don't have that desire maybe to go out and do something of your own, that doesn't mean you don't play a significant role in making it happen. The idea might have been mine to change the world from real time to life or to how we can save human lives or how we can rescue children going forward that have been abducted. But without the amazing team behind me, the people that also believed in giving up things in their life, giving up opportunities that other tech companies came to them and said, hey, come work on this next advertising. You'll make more money right now in the short term. But all these folks decided for the long-term gain, the long-term gain of that of saving human life was, was their mission. And I'm grateful to them every day and it just says the people that you'll work with to create something amazing will be grateful. And not only grateful, it wouldn't have happened without you. So just know that going forward, that you don't have to lead the change to create the change. And I can't overemphasize that enough. And especially in, in, in such a community as we're in today in Silicon Valley and here at Stanford, I know all of you are destined to do great things, either from starting something or being the sparks inside something that'll make, that'll make big difference in humanity. And all that I ask is that you ask yourself that internal question when you're doing it is, what are the ethics around this? How should we treat technology, artificial intelligence? How should we treat data? And ask yourself the question, if you weren't in this, and you really have to divorce yourself from the moment, and this was being done to you without you knowing about it, would you be okay with it? And if you get that little tinge, like I said, that's your real answer. You may choose to ignore it, but you can't say that you never felt it.